Welcome back, Oscar. Welcome back, everyone. And in a week where we saw derbies all around the world, in Rome, in London, the Derby of Italy, uh, Seville Derby, the Derby that took the cake was the Derby of Madrid, Rayo versus Real Madrid. Rayo coming out three two winners in a crazy game. Oscar, did you see this coming? I kind of I saw Rayo getting a drop, not a win. I didn't see. Rayo playing as excellently as they did to a man. I thought they were excellent today. Yeah, they've been very good and they've been good in these big occasions, like when they play against Atletico Sevilla. They've done really well. They won at the Sanchez Big One. They took points off Atleti and now they're beating Real Madrid. It just shows you how big of a job Irayo has done since he's come into Rayo, getting them up. And last season, they were also brilliant as well against Madrid. Let's not forget, but they were a bit unlucky. But this year, they played really well. They rode their luck at times. They defended well. And Madrid barely had any shots on target. Yeah, the only shots on target Real Madrid had were the goals. Dimitrevsky had nothing to do all game. <laughs> besides, besides, like, getting crowded when, like, their corner kicked or something. But, yeah, Iraul has done a fantastic job, like, we remember how we were raving about Rayo's start last season. Their start this season is actually even better. And wow. given how tight everything is, because everyone from third to eight besides Osasuna and Rayo didn't win this weekend. So they're pretty close to a Champions League spot right now, which tells you all you need to know about how um, good the feeling is at this club, the atmosphere. With the fans' relationship with the players and everything, the coach is just is just a beautiful story to see. And you could arguably say Rayo are La Liga's smallest club. So for them to do what they did today against the biggest team in the world was just amazing to watch. And it's a beautiful story, especially when you consider this is a club where the fans do not like the president. Every minute 13, they go against the president. The president treats the team like shit. He treats the women's team like crap as well. And you see how the fans come together. You see how they come together as a community. It's so beautiful to see as well. Yeah. And that community and everything, it's going to get better if Rayo can keep this up. I remember we keep saying this every podcast. They have Ralph de Thomas to add to this. You know this meme about <laughs> a chef cooking yeah. and there's fire. <laughs> then he just adds a little thing and then he just explodes. <laughs> sure, sure. It, it really could be like that. <laughs> yeah, it could be like that because last season when Ryo were doing well, the one concern we both had was that, yeah, they were playing well against them, similar mids, lower table teams at home, but their waveform was horrible. But this season, it feels like they're a more mature team. And yeah. when taken to the fact that they didn't really bring in much in terms of transfer, in terms of transfers and everything, they signed really well with Cameo in term, as a loan sign-in. It's still much of the same core from last season. It just yeah. shows that development. And this season, they convinced because when the big tests have come, they passed it with flying colors. Like the only game where I felt they fell short was that game against Osuna and Osuna flying this season. Yeah. And if Dreyer can keep, if they can avoid that dip they had towards um, in the second half of last season, they're in for big things this year. Yeah, they're in for big things. Maybe next season it's Raya Liverpool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but a team that's going to be playing Liverpool in Real next Madrid. year is Real Madrid. And who are not top anymore. <laughs> no, they're not top anymore. <laughs> I, I knew you were waiting for that, Oscar. <laughs> How long have you been waiting for uh, this? I've been waiting for this since it started. I'm like. Can somebody please beat these people? <laughs> I mean, I know as we have to give Rayo all the credit. Honestly, we have to give them all the credit. But Real Madrid today were were not good at all. Like this was by far the worst I've seen them play since PSG away from home. Like, and it seems this is a continuation of Girona. Yes, yeah, yeah, I feel so that's another point I want to make, and that's why I felt they wouldn't win this game. I feel like I feel like the three games they had before the World Cup were bananas, potential bananas games, because these kind of teams are teams that 
if you're not on your day, they can trip you up one way or another. Girona and Rayo have tripped Real Madrid up by actually taking the game to them a little bit. Rayo did so more than Girona. But then Real Madrid were just not at it for some reason. Like the energy levels they usually have were not there. Of course, missing some chances doesn't help, but overall, even when they were leading the game, you felt like Rayo don't deserve to be losing this at all. Yeah. And that's how it was the better team on day one. And if Real Madrid don't arrest this soon, they risk going into the World Cup, like having this bad run of form at the back of their mind for a whole month. Yeah. And, and it's crazy how things change because a month ago, after they won El Clasico convincingly, they won the Madrid Derby convincingly, we're like, who can stop them? And yeah. now Barca are two points out of them. Is this just a matter of the fact that they're finally feeling the effects of Karim Benzema being missing? Uh, Kroos is showing a bit yeah, of his I feel, age. I feel Kroos, Kroos, was, Kroos was the biggest miss today because... I'm sorry, Marjorie is showing... Yeah. Yeah, sorry. I think Kroos was a big miss today because they couldn't keep the ball at all. The Benzema team, I don't know because they were outgrowing Benzema Dependencia, if that's a word. They were outgrowing it a bit by a strong performance, like you said, in the derby and everything. So I don't know. We'll have to see if we have to see if this affects them after the World Cup, if Benzema is still having these fitness issues. Yeah, and another plan to come to discuss this, because obviously Kroos, he couldn't play this game, and that means more responsibility was put on Chouameni, who hasn't really been as brilliant as he was towards the start of the season. His game in the Madrid Derby was excellent, but since then, he's not really shined as much as he should have. I guess, yeah, I guess a, a game like this one does conflict is good. I feel like it's like it's a case of just be, being trusting because he's been given the difficult task of replacing Casemiro from nowhere. Like up until match day two of this season, he thought he was going to be Casemiro's understudy. So now he's had to fill in that role, and there's going to be lots of dips and rises with it. I feel. Yeah, and a player I want to bring into Fort who has been doing really well, who had issues at the start of the season is. Marco Asensio, if any player could go out there with his head out up high, it's Tim because he was the one creating all the chances. He yeah. provoked the go- the penalty. And he was also the one creating all, all the chances in Girona, although he did cause the penalty as well. Yeah. Um, Asensio had a good game. Uh, yeah, he's, like you said, he's the only one today that you say, can say um, tried a bit. And yeah, it's since Benzema hasn't been in the lineup, Asensi has been getting more opportunities. He's scoring. I believe he has got two in his last four games or five games. So it's good for him. And it for personally for him is boosting his chances of being called up to the, to the plane to Qatar. Yeah, in this moment Spain should take him by all means. Uh and but now Romagers lost means that as you know, Barcelona are top of the table. We got a big bombshell last week. Jared Piqué announced his retirement. I want you to, in a word or two, or a sentence or two, sum up Piqué's career at Barcelona. It was fun. It was fun. <laughs> I, I feel that's the most accurate word, because Piqué, right? Piqué is a different kind of Barcelona fan. Yeah. Like, there's a Barcelona fan and there's Piqué. Yeah. Like, man, this guy, this guy is Barcelona. The sacrifices he has made oh, in the last few years financially, also physically, like one thing I'll always say about Piquet, whether he makes a mistake or not in the last years, he always makes himself available. He's always ready to bleed for the club. And that's what I really love about him. So for him to suddenly hang up his boots really, really shocked me. <laughs> made me cry and everything. But it's good that you know, he was able to play last good game at Camp Nou, you yeah. know, got get a proper send-off. Hopefully at the end of the season, if we win something, we can, you know, do something for him and maybe anyone else who leaves. My goodness, my childhood is just <laughs> disappearing. Yeah, like, like I, I would say something about him is that, you know, throughout his career, I've always felt 
the one thing he lacked was his leadership. But in the last couple of seasons, he's shown that that he has leadership in ample quantities. Mm-hmm. Take aside the controversy with Cosmos and uh, Rubiales and REFEF, but Piquet was the first guy who scored for Barcelona when Messi left. And yeah. that was a big emotional goal. Mm-hmm. I take back to Barcelona's last trophy that was that they won, which was the Copa del Rey. He scored that goal against Sevilla. Sevilla, and that was so important. Like he's always there when Barcelona and they need him. He has his critics. People who might think he's not the greatest center back in the world, but his titles speak for themselves. The fact that he's, he's the most decorated center back ever. Like, yeah. The thing is that exciting to have the thing with all these things is that you only really appreciate these players when they're not playing the game. Sure. <laughs> like now. Was it not a month ago that I was angry with him for that mistake against him? <laughs> now, now I couldn't give two shits about that mistake. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he's done that... so much more than that. Well, yes, because he's pr- pretty much saved Barcelona's economy for next season. Because any potential um, hit they might have gotten from missing out on the Champions League, mm-hmm. his wages could cover that. Yeah. So he sacrificed so much for this club. And it's just sad sometimes that it's criticized so heavily when he's such a great leader, such a great yeah. captain. And yeah, I'm getting emotional too. <laughs> yeah. No, Jared Piquet, I don't know if you listen to that counter, but thank you from the bottom of my heart. <laughs> so, so let's anyway, get on. Back to the game. game. Back to the game, yeah. Capacity crowd, I can't move. Uh, our Maria didn't really show up today. Not at all. I feel like there are two things, right? Some important players like El Bilal Turi, who has been good for him recently, didn't play at all because if you look at it from an Almeria perspective, they have a tough day this coming week. So it makes more sense to rest their key players there and then yeah. just play whoever accompanies. It's kind of like what Gar- Garcia Plaza did against Real Madrid last year, <laughs> but then right. it really happened. It really their, did. their intention was not really to attack at all but I'll say mm-hmm. part of it was because I've, I I feel like we played one of our best games on Saturday in terms of mm-hmm. winning the ball back and pressing yeah. I felt like that also like made their at least made them make up their mind about what they were going to do <laughs> <laughs> but I also thought in the defense they did really well like the back six or so Made the Fabio game. Was a five. Uh, plus the goalkeeper. Yeah, yeah, the goal. yeah. yeah, Fernando was good. The defending sometimes they were kind of defend. Their defending was a bit weird sometimes, especially for Dembele's goal. Like the space between Sam Costa and, and Babich was just, or Babich or Eli, one of them was just yeah too open. I was like, what are you guys doing? Yeah, I, I felt that was a mistake for me because Kyle Key was having such a good game. Like we were speaking now, we haven't seen him since the game against Real Madrid. He comes to Camp Nou and he has he has, a, he has a spectacular game. And I think Ruby takes him out because of the yellow card. Maybe he's a bit yeah, scared. Yeah. That, yeah. Mm-hmm. But on the Barcelona perspective, Dembele scoring again. Lewandowski, he missed the penalty, but he still had a decent game. And things look things look kind of good for Barcelona. They're top of the table. Uh, in the Europa League, they have Mike C. United. Sailings, eh? <laughs> I mean, I don't know why Javi is complaining about it hard point. This should be an easy win. <laughs> I'm not I'm not I am not even joking. If okay, let me put it this way. If we have a fully fit team, if we have Kunde and Araho back, I see no reason why we should worry. Yeah. And this should be easy enough win. And what about Barca's think. chances in La Liga, though? Do you think now that Barca have taken control of the leadership, it's going to be like this towards the end or maybe towards the Costco? We can easily change next. This We can have a different conversation tomorrow because I'll start, you know how Rayo is a banana skin? Yeah. I'll start to know a banana skin too right. soon. Yeah, but I'll good. have to wait until tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, let's see. Let's see what happens there. But... The other big game we had this weekend in La Liga was the Seville Derby, and oh my God, it was it was a great derby. Lots of red cards, yeah. lots of 
Goodell turning into Spammer. <laughs> oh man, he was like, I saw, I saw a meme about Goodell being um, Maradona <laughs> for a day. <laughs> And, and but this yeah. game, it started with Sevilla doing quite well. I thought before the red cards, they were the better team. Only they edged it, but they were the better team. But the red card just changed things completely, and from then it was chaos. Yeah, the red card was really stupid. But yeah, like you said, Sevilla were Sevilla were the better team. I don't think it was by too much, but they were better, and they had the clearest opportunity that Rafa Mertens but. <laughs> of the line. Yeah, I, but I don't know. I feel Rafa Mir could have hit that with more power. But credit to Edgar, he had a great game. Yeah, this game was more about the fighting and everything, which in a derby I absolutely don't mind. The referee had, you know, if this was Valentine's Day, the referee would have been <laughs> so tired because of the card they had to give. Oh my God! Oh, the Betis. Though, did this show that they're missing something in terms of mentality that they let such an easy W slip away? Because I feel they lacked a bit of self control. They made Fekir made a rash decision with the elbow, and Bora made a tackle where he shouldn't have had for the second red card. Yeah, the, those are completely. I mean, the, the Fekir one, I'm still not convinced that. I feel that's an orange card, but I can see why you give it as a red. Borja's, I'm like, don't do that. Man. You just put your team in a really bad position. So yeah, it's like the it's like the players just got too emotional, and then because the it's an emotional derby and everything, and then everyone was just losing their heads left and right. Yeah. But who's that lack of maturity down to though? Is it down to just the players? Is it down to the atmosphere and them not dealing with it, or should Pellegrini do a better job in preparing his players for these kind of games? Yeah, you, you have to look at the players because yes, the atmosphere is all that, but you shouldn't let it affect it that way. You should let it affect it in a different way. You should let it raise your game instead of getting overwhelmed by it. You get like you're swimming, and then instead of you to go with it, you're getting carried by the tide. Yeah, but after that, after the card, it was down. It was nine versus eight. I think ten versus nine, and and then Sevilla couldn't take advantage. Besides, no. one just broke it. <laughs> yeah, but to be fair, Bravo made some really good saves. But you are right, Sevilla. They lacked a bit of creativity. I felt, I felt this game also exposed Jesus Navas because his crosses were horrible. Actually, Teas to his crosses were horrible from both to sides. To be fair, Jesus Navas had one good cross that could have led to a goal if not for Bravo right at the end. Oh, yeah. But yeah, like the crest in front of Sevilla's fullback was dreadful. I feel, um, I feel this was a game where they missed Isco because Isco left was unavailable through suspension. Lamella tried, but then when your center forwards are missing sitters, there's only so much you can do. Oh, yeah. At one point, when Enesri missed that chance, the commentator was like, Enesri is Betis' best defender in that situation. I was like, yeah. yeah. And what do we think about Sevilla going forward? Because San Paolo has been here for over a month. And for me, it seems like although they're more protagonist in the game, nothing much has changed for them. Yeah. I don't, honestly, I don't know what the future holds for them. Like, like, first of all, his lineups and his decisions are kind of confusing because when it was 11 v 11, for some weird reason, the Firmino was playing out the right wing. Yeah. I, like, I don't get this whole square peg in round hole mentality he's doing. I don't get it either. I, I, but uh, the future is not good for Sevilla unless they're strikers or one of them just steps up and says, I'm going to be responsible. But guys, you keep because Sevilla do get maybe two or three good chances every game where you'd expect if you score one, then the game changes. So they need someone to start taking advantage of that. Yeah, because they created about 20 chances in this game. And the fact that they only have one goal to show for it. And most of the really good shots were taken by the center defensive midfielder. Say something yeah. about the strikers. And it just leads me to think, is this... Was it always Lopetegui's fault, or is this more a Munchie fault? And I think Munchie's... No, I definitely feel 
This whole this whole team is more of Munchie's fault than any coach. Yeah. We'll see. We, we keep saying, you know, maybe they might put a run together, but I don't know. Yeah. Like from the rest. After, after the World Cup, we might start talking about relegation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because they're at one point in the game, they were in the relegation zone. If they had lost, they would have been there, stuck in the relegation zone. Mm-hmm. But this is a team that I feel definitely needs some changes in January, unless things could get very ugly for them, regardless yeah. of who you bring in. Mm-hmm. And speaking about Manchu, what do you make of his um, salute to the fans? Because that caused a bit of controversy. I'm mm-hmm. okay with it because I feel like football deserves characters I mean, like this and yeah. things like this make the derbies more fun. Yeah. But I, I, mean, I it's want to fine. Know. It's just, you know, he has to be, I feel like you, it's fine doing it, but you also have to remember this is a derby where fans, some idiot fans are not afraid to throw stuff at you. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, because the best you're right, is... If you're okay with the risk, then... Yeah. Because it was described by Betis as like inciting violence. And I'm like, dude, your fans had a tickle where it had a poll of like what you guys did to John Jordan. So you can't really say inciting violence for, for saying hi to fans. I mean, that, I mean, the thing is that anything can incite violence in life. It's just you shouldn't be, in, you shouldn't react to certain things unless you're a mad person. Yeah. Yeah, it's like the thing with the dancing and stuff where it's like... Like you yeah. can walk on the road and incite violence <laughs> from a crazy person, can't you? True, true. So, yeah. Yeah. But anyways, let's move on to Atleti, who have been in a bit of a crisis recently, and things have gotten worse for them since we last spoke. They're yeah. out of Europe altogether. Indeed. They play against 10 men Espanol, and they can't get the win. Yeah. They had the most shots they've had this season, and nothing. I don't know. It's like it's it's not as if they're. If you are saying to the one creating chances, that's a totally different thing. But then they're just so wasteful. Like this season, they go between being super clinical to being extremely wasteful, and I just don't get it. No. Their away form, at least, has been very good. It's just the home form, for some reason, is just dreadful. Yeah. And it's because of this, like you said, wastefulness. And, you know, there are a lot of other team fans accusing the players of not caring and everything. Uh, that, I don't know about that, but they, they, if, they take, if they start taking their chances, I'm sure things will look better for them and they can pull ahead of their mm-hmm. fellow competitors. Because the, the thing is, if you look at how it's gone in this sense, the draw against Rayo, and we all know Rayo is a good team. And look at the points they've dropped against Cadiz, which I felt they should have won. They could have, they should have won this game. Espanyol, although played a brilliant game defensively, mm-hmm. if they had won both games, there will be three points behind Real Madrid, five points behind Barcelona. And it's just like they confuse me because they have the quality to be a team that somewhat pretends to compete for this title. But then it's just like their luck has run off. Something it's like they're paying for all those last minute goals they scored from last season. Yeah. <laughs> and they also miss what Suarez gave them in 2020, 2021, I feel. Yeah, that's the thing. Suarez was super consistent in, t- in that season. And Atleti, this was a problem they had last year. They have a lot of stop and start players. Yeah. Like now, the latest stop and start player, Joe Felix, he has started. It probably and it's going to stop obviously because of the World Cup, but <laughs> you know, that's the issue. Korea is out of form right now. Kunia yeah. is out of form. Griezmann, Griezmann is still playing well, but who knows how long that's going to be. But I feel like he has been their most consistent out of everybody. Yeah, I, I feel what Athletic really need is they need to sell two or three of those attacking midfielders and focus on investing money on a proper number nine because that's what this team needs a number nine i know Morata is a, he's a great guy he's a fun guy he's nice and everything but he's too inconsistent to make athletes make that leap in quality that they need to make i yeah. feel the mistake they made possibly was not signing Vlaovic last season yeah. and not going all out for him instead they brought in Cunha 
who hasn't really worked. I, I don't think he scored a goal or he, I don't think he scored more than one goal this season. Mm-hmm. Griezmann has somewhat worked, but it's also upsets, I feel, the balance of the way things were before he came in. Mm-hmm. And Morata has come back and I, I feel fine he's contributed in terms of goals, but he's not that clinical striker that takes your team to a level beyond the Sevillas or the Villarreal's or the Betis's in La Liga at the moment. Yeah. I agree, and they definitely need that. And I feel, like you said, there are a lot of these stops that players they can do with selling a couple of them. Yeah. But a word on Espanol, they were they were really good, it, it, despite the fact they went down to 10 men. Sergio Dardai scored a brilliant goal. It's similar to, I'm not sure if you've seen this. this, this might be before your time, but it's like Zidane versus Bayern Munich. The way I think, I, I think I mean, I've seen it in a comp somewhere. Yeah, it was a similar goal, and they really... It's a, it's a really yeah. huge point for them, especially yeah. given that your 10 men away at Atletico Madrid, the team that you normally don't do well against. So Diego Martinez can really pat himself on the back for this one, I believe. I don't know how much point they are away from the relegation zone, but at any point will do at this point. Yeah, and they're a weird team because, like, you look at them and you're like, they're not really bad. They should be concerned, but they're also not really good. And yeah. I remember watching Espanol from last season, like, and they were brilliant at times. Like, they played some integrated passing with Dardar and De Tomas. But this season, it feels like there isn't really much to really like about this team or enjoy this team. No, the thing is that they're playing, they're basing their game around Hossel, who isn't exactly the most versatile kind of food, so I can understand why their play looks kind of limited now. Yeah. But then Hustle has been performing well. He gave the assist to Darder, so I guess that's working. They just need to get more productivity from, you know, the likes of Bradsweet, Poado, and everyone. Yeah, yeah. And as let's see, they will be under pressure from Osasuna when they visit Mallorca later on, but Asuna, they're t- going to play Barcelona on, on Tuesday, and they have been flying so far. They ruined Carlos Cavallo's their, uh, debut at Celta. Yeah. Uh, so, so, yeah, two absolutely great goals from Chimiazu. Goodness, if you haven't seen them, you have to see them. Celta, they couldn't really respond too much. I thought the second half was just physical as soon as being focused. We know Celta aren't really going to hurt us. Let's just keep things organized. I mean, Celta, there was no creativity, just a few sparks here and there. And yeah, like um, Adura last week made that good point. This team is really missing Denis Suarez. Yeah, they have a Denis Suarez size hole. And from what I read from Celta forums, it seems that they might look towards getting Andre Horta from Braga, who's doing really well at Braga. And um, Benfica wanted him this summer, but that didn't materialize. And it seems like he might be a good player for them. So, yeah, they need all the help they can get, right? I feel another thing that I feel one of the reasons why they're struggling is because you know how. Is set certain players that shall not be mentioned were <laughs> able to support as fast pretty well with goals. Yeah. No one has really been able to pitch in. So they need someone to do that because Paciencia hasn't, Carlos Perez hasn't. Larson hasn't. And Frank Larson has played well, but yeah. they haven't added much productivity. The yeah. closest person to doing this has been Oscar. So they need more support. For their main man. Yeah, they definitely do. And when you contrast them with a team like Osasuna and how, although Chimi Avila is their Galactico, but their the work team comes to mind and, and it's like they're not dependent on a single player compared to Celta with Aspas. Yeah, I agree. And you have um, Budimir, you have Kiki Garcia, you have um, Mark Gomez chipping in. So yeah, there's options at Osasuna, and you can't really say that a lot. So that game. Yeah, that game is going to be a trap game for Barcelona because the one thing I, I just remembered is this is the last game for the World Cup, 
And it gives a sort of like last game before Christmas sort of feel. And that's when teams tend to like, especially bigger teams tend to relax a bit. Mm. And Osuna is going to have that motivation. But maybe what happened to Madrid tonight is fall in the fire for Barcelona. Yeah, it's definitely, it's pretty possible, especially given the atmosphere. Like, also, that is objectively the loudest, one of the loudest stadiums in Europe, not the loudest. So, and we've won only one of our last two, three visits there, so it's definitely not going to be easy. So, yeah. Oh. yeah, it's not going to be easy at all, but on the flip side, Villarreal, they are struggling at the moment at home. Mm-hmm. Mallorca came there and Mallorca did what Mallorca did. They defended really well. The lines were super thin and they were so clinical on the counterattack. How big of a sign-in has Morici been? Because I, I described it in our group chat as the mid-table of Lewandowski. Yeah, this signing, this signing was what saved them last year. And it looks like it's going to save them pretty comfortably this year. Also, we have to shout out our Matt. He's been brilliant since he came back and he scored one of the goals of the season. Yeah. Yeah, it's a pity for him that there were so many glasses this week. Yeah. And and with the math, it's like he had that surgery to his to his leg because he had something there that was disturbing him for so long, ever since he was in Tenerife. And when he was in Tenerife, he was like genuinely really good. And I thought he was someone who could knock on the door. Of the Atleti squad, but he, I'm glad he's showing that quality that he has right now. Whenever he's come on the bank, she's really been good for them. And it seems like his teammates really support him as well. Yeah, it was really good to see. Like when the players coming back from injury and they score a goal, it's really good because you see how much it means to them, how much it means to the team, how much it means to the fans. Yeah, so it was a good sight to see. So. Yeah. I mean, it was. As a neutral, as you can say. It was. But on, on the opposite side for Kike Setien, it's been four games already, and the fans are shouting, Kike, get out. Yeah. yeah. And the thing is that two of those games have been absolutely meaningless because he came against them, Hapoel and Lech. So Villarreal were already top of the group. So those games don't really mean much. If you're looking at them aside, and then in the league, yeah, the two games having the one to the, the one yesterday was very poor. They had some chances that could have changed the flow of things, but then it's basically all the four games are telling the same story sterile possession, and that's what's probably causing these fans to panic. And I don't know, I don't feel Four games is enough to sack someone, but then I definitely didn't agree with this appointment. So no, yeah, I, I I feel the thing though is like his appointment was built in the mind of like you know what, let's just get through the games before the World Cup, and once the World Cup begins, we can have a proper preseason. We can get the players adapted to his style, because you are right in that what we've seen from Villarreal so far is the worst of PK Setien at Betis at Barcelona where. A lot of possession, which I don't think really suits this VRL team, especially from the defense. But they create not much. And maybe that's because they need some additions in January. They possibly need a striker or Gerard Moreno has to come back from his injury that's been plight in VRL. Uh, it definitely takes time for, for them to adapt to a completely new style. Like, you saw with Valencia Athletic Club, they had a whole preseason to do it. Whereas Kike Setien, even if he d- he's going to get the time of race because I don't believe they'll sack him, but this thing you have you have a whole World Cup where you won't be without Pau Torres. If he doesn't get injured, you'll be without a bunch of key players too. So yeah. We'll have to really assess Kiki Setien well after the World Cup because four games is not enough to start seeing Kiki out. No, and, and the, the thing is, I feel I feel at least the results against Athletic and this results could have happened even under Unai Emery because Unai Emery, he, he is a good cup manager, but in the league, he was having similar results. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Uh, and true moments for Real Sociedad Valencia. Yeah. Because this game was, I felt it was a game where the red card sort of spoiled the game. Because Real Sociedad, they started ever so well, but then they had that red card, Aritza sent off. Valencia comes back into the game. Should Valencia fans be worried about this slump in form that we've seen so far? Because it's been four or five games and no wins. Yeah. I feel you can start worrying a bit because, like you said, when you don't win in so long, it doesn't matter how you play, whether you're playing well or not. Like, not winning starts bearing on your mind. And if you don't manage, if it's down to Gattuso to really motivate the player. There have been some injuries to Cavani and some absences in midfield in some of these games. It's just about trying to get through this. But yesterday was a big mistake for the to not to get that win because you're against ten men for more than seventy minutes. And also Russell the Sidat side whose squad has been depleted heavily by exactly it's an interesting that squad on top of everything. Yeah. Speaking of Russell Sidat, they, they they got some good news this week in that they topped their Europa League group. And how mm-hmm. big of it is how big of is this news for Real Sociedad, given the fact that in Europe they've not really impressed all before, but like this season it seems like they've been more mature, they've taken things seriously and they're doing well. Yeah, I said at the beginning of the season that it's important that they and Betis get take first and avoid all the big boys and everything because you just get paired against the Champions League team like and that will just ruin your cup dream so now that you I mean you 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 can still get them in the round of 16 but you know at least you're giving yourself a better opportunity of getting to the final if you take first yeah that, that is for sure because now they can relax a bit they can they don't have to worry about that first game and it means that they have more energy for what's to come Yes, exactly. And hopefully the World Cup break should allow them to recover their point. They are one of, they are one of the teams that at least someone like David Silva will be won't be called up for Spain because he's done he's won a World Cup already. He doesn't need another one. Yeah. So you can I mean all can work with him and um, the squad and everything. And I want to talk about their next door neighbors, Athletic Club, because they they were doing really well, but then they entered into this tough run. And now they've lost they've been lost to Girona. But Girona, they were they were brilliant last week. I'm just joking, they were brilliant last week against Real Madrid. And this was one of Girona's best performances. Yeah, and Girona ended their eighth game winless streak at the Either way, it was a great performance by Girona. Athletic Club, like you said, they've been stuttering a bit in the past four or five games. And they're, they're definitely one of the teams that's looking at this World Cup break and like that. This couldn't come at a better time, so we can just regroup. Yeah. And the thing about it is, uh, I felt this was this game and the game at the camp was, I felt Athletic didn't show their true selves in that. They're normally a team that's very good in counterattack. They're very good in recovering the ball high up the pitch, and we didn't really see that from them. And Girona, like they had so many shots in the first half, they had so many chances. I felt Athletic, this result sort of flattered them a bit because I think Girona should have won by three or four. Yeah, definitely the performance. I feel. Be, apart from the campaign performance, this was probably the worst performance this season because in the other games earlier in this room where they didn't pick up points, you could at least still see that character in athletic, that um, short taking, the pressing, the counter-attacking. Yeah, I don't know. It could be something related to energy levels, maybe. like Because adapting to a new style at some point, you're going to get a little dip and then you'll get another rise again. So I feel definitely definitely for sure they need this break so they can regroup and 
refocus their mind on the objective. Yeah. And the crazy thing about this La Liga season, although Madrid and Barca are running away with the league title race, is that a team like Athletic or Rayo, who we've spoken about, or Suna, they're all within three points between themselves and Atleti and Betis. So despite this dip in form, Athletic are just three points away from the top three. Yes. Yeah. And that, that's because everyone, like you said, has just been messing up. Like, <laughs> like even before, like everyone was talking about how Betis would wash Sevilla, but then it was like, the team of this season is that if you're in this top four race, you're going to be an inconsistent team. Yeah. So that's the thing. I mean, it makes things interesting because now there's hope for, like, imagine Rayo and Osasuna competing in the top four. Yeah, yeah. Compared to, like, the previous seasons where it's been so obvious because... Yeah, like, it's really been so been... obvious which of the four teams is going to be like. We already yeah. know two of the teams. Unless they have both have a freaking collapse, but which is possible. Yeah, it's possible. Yeah. And then we and then you have Atleti. We're all like, okay, Atleti will be the third because Atleti, we know they're Atleti, but then they finished last in their Champions League group. Yeah. I'm not sure what to expect from these guys anymore. No, no one is, but Maybe it maybe a team like it's Real really Bayern. Yeah, it's really exciting. Like it makes you picture all sorts of teams. <laughs> yeah, it's it's like 1999-2000 La Liga season, but with Real Madrid and Barcelona doing their own thing. Uh, what it, and what would be funny is if a team like Real Valladolid finishes in top four. <laughs> They're not too far from it. They're not too far from it. Should they dream? Real Valladolid ain't too far from the top. Four. No. You, you might not be wrong, actually, because they've actually been playing really well, too. Yeah. And they showed that in their game against Elche, didn't they? Yeah, they really... If not for Edgar Badia, these guys would have absolutely destroyed it. So that two, that two one scoreline is an absolute lie. <laughs> yeah, and... but, yeah, Badia was Superman until the first minute of the second half and then... <laughs> Yeah, could, there's only so much you can do. The guy deserves a better defense. Yeah, he does. He deserves the best team, to be honest. But this game was the end of uh, Jorge Almiron, yeah. whose horrible, horrible run of not winning La Liga continues. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's like this thing. He just comes in, and I don't know how long he's been at the job, but he's gone. Yeah. And the LJ job right now is like, who really wants it? Because... If you're having to go back to a coach you sacked not too long ago, that's not a good sign. No, and it's not. not like they can call. It's not like they can call Francisco back because he has a new job already. <laughs> no, and the thing is, is that they're saying Jose Bordalas might be interested in this job. Ooh, that'll be interesting. Yeah, it's a, it's it'll be a total change of style for them, but I feel yeah, he's the kind they of manager. Kind of nice, but then. You know, in their situation, I feel back to basics might be needed, especially when it comes to defense. Yeah. yeah. It's it's just sad the way this club, who were so, they were a breath of fresh air for the last two years, yeah. has dwindled into, like, they just look like they're already in Segunda right now. Exactly. Yeah. Like, you definitely can say Ultra are gone unless... Like something inspirational happens. Yeah, but the thing is, you never know, right? Because like even when we're talking about Sevilla or Celta, they're all, they're like five points away from mid table. Ultra are seven points away from the relegation from safety, which mm-hmm. twenty four games that that's nothing. Yeah, but then thirteen games into a season, you can pretty much yeah. decide most patterns and. The pattern for them is not good at all. No, not very good at all. Not very good. But you know what? If they're competing against teams like Hetafe and Cadiz, who prefer to like keep things zero zero and handshake and zero zero and gracias, then maybe maybe there's a chance. <laughs> zero zero and gracias. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I woke up early in the morning. I saw Hetafe versus Cadiz. I was like, <laughs> and that's it. You guys go back to that. To watch football. Admittedly, because there's been a lot of stuff going on, but I looked at one I'm like, of all the games, this one, I'm like, 
No. <laughs> no. Like, I know what you guys are going. Yeah, Hatafi have been playing well recently. We've heard to them. Ronald is scoring free kicks for fun, but and he almost scored again, <laughs> but he hit the post. Sorry, this podcast is not the Spanish North fan club, but I have to mention that. Yeah. It's like, okay, both their teams got a decent point in the battle for survival, and uh, the Hetafe have, I'll say, an easier task than Cardiff this coming game but week. But again, that easy task is like, a really important task because you're playing against a direct rival in Almeria. Yeah. And Almeria, they've been so good at home recently. They've just like blown yeah. teams that come. Yeah, the is something else, but then at home with rested players like Bill Alturi, it could be difficult for Tafi. Yeah, it could be. It could be at for Cadiz, they have Real Madrid. It would be nice if they could get Carlos Acapo on one match alone, <laughs> given how we shut down Vinicius last season. But <laughs> they could they could get Bali. Bali did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> True, but but yeah, I think that that's it for La Liga. Except I've forgotten a team somewhere, and so we're going to go with this section. And then who is the best team this week and the best player for you, Oscar? Best team this week will be Rayo Vallecano for. Finally doing delivering God's justice. God's <laughs> okay. plan. Yeah, yeah, I'll say Rival can be the best team. Like that performance against the best team in the world, Yuck, was incredible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and best player for you? Best player. I just want to say a bit high. I said Chimmy Avila. Chimmy Avila. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'll go with Uriah for the best team, but I think the best player this week was Nemanja Gudeli. I feel he had... Uh, that's, a, that's a good one. That's a good one. Yeah, I feel he had that, like, he was the soul of Sevilla in that derby. Mm-hmm. Yeah, should we move on to Italy? Yeah. Yeah, let's start, with, yeah let's start with Napoli. They, they, they won against Atalanta They're comfortably. Like, there's a big gap developing between Napoli and Atalanta, isn't there? Yes, um, so, um, it was especially the Osimhen show because it was really it was really important for him to score that goal and give the assist and come back against a difficult opponent in Atlanta, in Atlanta who have been caught adrift in recent weeks. Like Milan have jumped ahead of them, and yeah, it's really a big boost for Napoli winning a big game like this. And what should we expect of Napoli in the Champions League? They've been drawn with Eintracht Frankfurt. Is this the time for Napoli to finally break that last 16 barrier that even Diego Maradona couldn't break? Yeah, they ha- I think this is the biggest opportunity and chance they have to break now. I feel like I don't know how they'll be or how any team will be at come the other side of this World Cup, but if they play this game now, you'd have to give Napoli the title of overwhelming favorites. Yeah, but we can't underestimate Eintracht Frankfurt and you yourself. Yeah, you can't. You can't uh, I know that from personal experience. <laughs> yeah, but there were other big games in Italy. Let's start with the Rome Derby. Lazio gets in a win against Roma. And it's the, Sarri felt under pressure after that, um, just after he got eliminated from the Europa League. But That crazy elimination. Yeah, where everyone all, finished all, all, all on eight points. Intense group, but like he's redeemed himself yeah. a bit with this derby win. Yeah, he's redeemed himself definitely. But it's, 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 the room derby is very one of the most beautiful ones, and you know to win it at they share the same stadium. So why am I saying at Roma? But yeah, yeah. to beat Roma yeah. definitely takes a lot of the pressure. <laughs> yeah, true, true, true. It definitely does, and Juventus too. They're like. There's less pressure on them, given their nation, because they beat their big rivals into Milan. The one thing I find yeah, curious about Juventus is... Right now. Yeah, and the thing is, in Serie A, it seems like defensively, they're much stronger. They're playing with younger players. Mm-hmm. But in the Champions League, it seems like they can't seem to keep a clean sheet to save their lives. And that's something that's happening with Barcelona. Yeah, both of them got pretty tough groups. So, yeah, but with UV, this win is more, kind of more surprising because their performances have been 
extremely flat in the Champions League. At least with Barca, you could see some substance to some of their performances. But with UV, yeah, this makes this win against Inter more of a shock. <laughs> I feel like the Costage coming into form was really good. And it's also going to be good for his country. Because yeah, he's sure. someone that, you know, when he's on form, he can do magic things with that left foot. Yeah, I also know that from personal experience. Yeah, maybe, maybe he does that against Barcelona again in the Europa League. Crap. Uh, <laughs> uh, and with Inter Milan, they have FC Porto. Porto, we know them from being in Athletics Group. We know they're, they're always an awkward team. But this should be a good opponent for Inter to go to the quarterfinals. Yeah, like Napoli, Inter have... We have a huge chance to see two Serie A teams in the quarterfinals of the Champions League, which has not happened in God knows how long. So, yeah, yeah they definitely, and Porto, but no, you know, not easy by any means. So, it's going to be a great game, I feel. Yeah, it's going to be a great game. Milan, too, they got a win later on and they got Spurs. So, this is more of a tight one, but. I'll say yeah, Milan have a chance to go through too. Yeah, it just depends on Milan themselves because they can. You know how Italian teams can be. Yeah, but I'll say I'll say the one thing that hurts them that hurt them against Chelsea was not having Manion there, and if mm-hmm. Manion can be fit for this game, like Spurs, they had an easy group, but it took it cost them the world almost to qualify. So mm-hmm. I would say maybe they're not. A super tough opponent for Milan, although I no, think they are that tough. Yeah. So I feel this is a game that depends on Milan more than it depends on Spurs. Yeah. And if they can keep Rafael Leal by Christmas. Yeah. Yeah. And now let's move on to England, where the London Derby happened, and Arsenal beat Chelsea. Win the game. Yeah, yeah, and 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 I believe this was in Stamford Bridge, if I'm not correct, if I'm not yeah. wrong. And how big yeah, is Stanford. Yeah, and th- this is a big statement from Arsenal because they've won against one of the guys in the big six, the so-called big six. And it just shows that maybe they might have a chance to compete for the title. Yeah, definitely. They're showing they're really showing signs of a champion team, you know, all these one 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 new to the rest to the Arsenal, like they used to say back in the day. Yeah, Mateta is getting the job done, but Manchester City are still finding ways to win too. Yeah, yeah. And with City, they were down to 10 men, but somehow they won in the final minutes of the game. Obviously, Haaland's for in again. I think he's he's just make it's just the league is super easy for him. Yeah. Uh, both Haaland and Julian Alvarez are really coming into the own now. When you have yeah, from our from an Arsenal perspective, it must be frustrating knowing that your closest rival has those two monsters, <laughs> especially an either can come off the bench. Yeah, it feels this is going to be interesting. We'll have to see how this um you know affects things after the break because Habel Jesus who has been really key for Arsenal this season, is going with Brazil. Yeah. Gabriel and- Medales, <laughs> who I feel ha- should have gone isn't going so we'll see how this whole World Cup affects everybody. And Holland is just gonna be chilling at home waiting. Holland is just going to be chilling in the lab. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is in some cryo chamber. So City have Leipzig in the champions again. This this should be it for City, right? With Holland resting in the cryo chamber somewhere. They're they're going to breeze through Leipzig. Yeah, City are always getting these, I don't want to say easy, but, you know, not so difficult draws. It makes you wonder. <laughs> yeah, it does make you wonder, especially when you consider that Bayern Munich got PSG in the Champions oh, League. PSG and, got Bayern Munich. Or PSG got Bayern Munich. Munich. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, where, where do you see this so far? Like, do you think this is a year where PSG can make it a statement? Given the fact that they've gotten by in this area, I'm going to say no. No, okay. <laughs> Sad for PSG. I don't have too much confidence in them beating the Germans right now. 
Yeah. They've done it before, but I don't know. I feel like that intensity Bayern have against PSG not being as intense might be what makes the difference. Yeah, but this is what PSG bought Gauteng for, for games like this, to make that difference. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and it's up to him to manage the stars and everything and see a way to really make this PSG team live up his potential. Yeah, yeah, so it's really up to him. Bayern, they went back to the top of the table in the bonus league. Yay, it finally happened. Uh, Dortmund also won, so they're not too far. Thank you, Bayern Leverkusen, for <laughs> absolutely destroying Union Berlin. <laughs> Xabi Alonso's Bayern Leverkusen. Yeah. For, yes, our Spanish boy is doing well in the Bundesliga. Dortmund, they have Chelsea in another English-German affair. I um, didn't even notice that draw, honestly. <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, that, that should, that's a, that's an interesting one. Yeah. And Chelsea are kind of stop start themselves too, so who knows? Yeah, who um, knows? Obama and Gressel's that one is going to be an interesting subplot. Yeah, and Bellingham playing against an English team. The English media is going to be like, who do I pick? Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Well I I'm, I feel out of all the ties, that's like possibly Besides the PSG buying one, that's possibly the most intriguing one where you're not really sure what you're going to get. Yeah. Yeah. And Oh, I have also forgot to listen to Chris as Dortmund. Oh, you know, there's some good. players right now that you just forget they exist because they're not really <laughs> doing much. Like now Hazard, I'm like, oh, Hazard is still on payroll. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, he's been linked to Aston Villa and Newcastle, so maybe he might be there after the World Cup if he has a good one. Oh, to, has that to lead Newcastle into the Champions League? That would be, <laughs> that would be something. Yeah, it's like this, it's like goal. Yeah, but he he, 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 need, he needs to get up in Real Madrid and just revive his career somewhere. Yeah, Newcastle, like, this. Like, that's what I was saying. I forgot the exit. And like you look at all the options and Chelsea has the adventure. He's not in, in, in looking hazards way. Yeah, it's it's painful that the only classical hazard I played is the one that was in friendly. Yeah, friendly. <laughs> yeah, but let's move on to the French league. Uh, Marseille, they they finally won after bottling their Champions League group, finishing at the bottom of the table, which was the most Marseille thing. They beat Lyon, PSG. They look swimming in the French league. It seems like they're gonna win it quite comfortably. But is that a shock? No, it's not a shock. It's not a shock. Yeah. But the final Champions League game, I feel we haven't spoken about this, Benfica versus Club Brugge. Uh, yeah. I, I'm, I'm really happy for this draw because I feel yeah. we're going to see a true story come out of, out of it soon. Because yeah. if Benfica go further into the quarterfinals, given how they've played, given what they've done against PSG or against Juventus, this could be the story of the Champions League, the Cinderella of the Champions League, like Villarreal last season. Yeah, exactly. Benfica have definitely have the potential to do something. And then if they or Brook, whoever gets through, can draw against, let's say the winner of Napoli, Eintracht, or Inter, Porto, um, Porto or Milan Spurs, I think. We know what UEFA are going to do. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm going been... to funnel things from a certain country into different. <laughs> you, you see this whole bracket thing they invented. Yeah. Since then, teams from a certain country have been, you know. Yeah. You know what I'm getting that. <laughs> I know, I know. I, I feel like if Liverpool beats Real Madrid, it's going to be funneled towards the Liverpool City final. If Bayern, <laughs> if Liverpool don't beat Real Madrid, they're going to go for a Bayern City final. Yeah. But yeah, it is your thought. Or, by, or PSG, Man City. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, that would be such a funny final because the two teams yeah, that Alan everyone versus... hates. <laughs> Alan versus Mbappe, Qatar versus Abu Dhabi. <laughs> one oil team is going to win. Yeah. Yeah, and everyone's going to cry one way or the other. <laughs> everyone is going to be crying one way or another. <laughs> Yeah. And with that, we hope you all aren't, aren't crying and you've enjoyed our podcast. Thank you, Oscar, for doing this with me again. And uh, see you all next week.
Adios. Lunch you mean Friday. Oh yeah, Friday. Yeah, see you on Friday. Wink wink. <laughs>